Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the webinar, Elevating Sustainability Reporting with Advanced Energy and Water Data Collection. We're excited to discuss today how improvements in collecting and organizing data can improve sustainability reporting. We hope you find the session engaging and informative. My name is Eric Becker, and I'm the VP of Sales at Urgenet. For those of you who are unfamiliar with us, Urgenet automates the collection, normalization, and delivery of utility bill and interval data. In a nutshell, we provide the utility data that organizations need for a variety of purposes, including energy analysis, sustainability reporting, bill payment, and more. Joining me today are Alistair McDougall, Energy Analyst at Verdantix, and Alistair Blackmore, Head of Implementation at Credit360. Sustainability and going green are increasingly becoming high priority topics on the agenda of C-level executives and public officials. The steady increase in voluntary and mandatory sustainability reporting requirements is putting pressure on firms to measure their progress against quantifiable sustainability goals. <clears throat> Good data, both water data and energy data, is the basis for sustainability management and reporting. During this webinar, you'll learn why having high quality data is so crucial, what the challenges are associated with collecting water data and energy data, and how these processes are being automated for the first time. You'll also learn how software can be used for data visualization, reporting and performance management. And at the end of our session, we'll have time for Q&A. If you have any questions during the webinar, please use the chat tool to send these to our presenters. We'll do our best to answer as many of these questions as we can during the Q&A portion of our session today. And now I'd like to hand it over to Alistair McDougall with Verdantix to talk about the importance of high quality data in corporate sustainability reporting. So thank you very much, um, Eric, for that introduction and good morning and good afternoon uh, everyone joining us today. So as Eric mentioned, my name is Alice McDougall and I'm a sort of analyst here at Verdantix and just a little bit uh, about what I do here. So I would have all of our research on energy management software and industrial technologies and through uh, that research we support corporates in terms of trying to develop their energy sustainability and eh and s strategies. In terms of the firm, uh, we're very much uh, one of the only independent analyst firms out there that is completely focused on energy, environment, health and safety and sustainability. Uh, we were founded in 2007 and we have offices in London and New York. In terms of today's topic around elevating sustainability reporting, uh, why, why is this happening? Well, one of the things we find is that firm's attitudes towards sustainability are really changing. So. Here on this slide is um, data from our Global Sustainability Leaders Survey, where we uh, interview the heads of sustainability across a number of different industries and geographies about some of the core things behind their sustainability strategy. And what this data is really showing is that firms are, are starting to fully understand that while sustainability can have some long-term impact, there's also short-term and medium-term impacts which are impacting their organization now. And this is really good news for the sustainability world because it, it's all too easy um, to put things off when you're talking long-term. However, when you start to realize that there's short and medium-term issues, you really have to ramp up um, the importance of the topic, but also uh, what you're doing around it in terms of your strategy and what procedures you have in place. Another thing that is sort of really sort of promoting sustainability is the, the continued growth in the number of firms um, communicating their sustainability strategy and performance through sustainability reports. A lot of this is being driven even by customer insights, so customers and stakeholders requesting greater information. So this chart here just shows the number of firms submitting GRI reports, so reports to the Global Reporting Initiative, and how that's growing per region, and we see here that this isn't just a Western Europe and North America led initiative. We're seeing an incredible increase in the number of firms in Africa, Asia, Latin America, also realizing the importance of not just capturing sustainability data, but also reporting it. There's also a number of different frameworks which are being developed to try and help firms uh, really report on their non-financial data and just three of them here are on the slide, but again, these frameworks are helping promote uh, the topic of sustainability and, and trying to make it easier for firms to disclose that information. 
but they also add a little bit of complexity into the decision making because which one should I choose, um, which one's most suitable for my organization, well that's some of the work that we do here at Redantix is supporting that, but one of the key themes today around the sort of data aspect is that if you have good uh, data collection and management, you really start to provide some flexibility where you don't have to choose which um, framework necessarily you would like to report on. You could report against all three if you wish or incorporate the good parts from each component. The most important factor is that has to be done with good data behind it. And that's even more important when you look at the number of voluntary disclosures and certifications. So again, these are just some examples of initiatives that we see firms um, embarking on, whether that be Energy Star, um, GRES, getting their building sort of weed certified. All of these uh, certifications and voluntary disclosures require firms to have a really good handle on their data. And realistically, what we're seeing with most firms is they don't have that first stage um, set out properly. The data is the problem. Once you have a good quality data set that you can work from, you can choose to respond to all or few of these. All you need to work out is what data is required um, to gain my ISO 50001 certification, for example. And you can look at your um, database, data source, and quickly identify where you're going to source that information. The days of having to have multiple conversations and, and try and figure out where that data resides they should be behind us, um, but we're seeing firms just, just really starting to embark on that journey now. But again, it highlights the value of data and data management is it gives you this flexibility when it comes to actually using that data. And, and we're seeing firms actually appreciate how important this is. So on this slide, I've, I've actually got results from our free uh, global surveys, which we do on a sort of annual or biannual basis. Um, so 260 sustainability leaders, 83% um, see that improving corporate sustainability reporting is either very important or important. Uh, 250 EH&S leaders, 82% of those uh, leaders agreed that sustainability data collection and reporting is very important and important for their organization. And of the 286 energy leaders uh, we've just interviewed, so this is a brand new study, not yet released. So uh, this is even a sneak preview of some of the results, 84% felt that their firm needed to further improve energy data collection and reporting. Um, so again, this shows that it's not just one individual or one group of individuals within an organization which is placing importance on this. There's multiple people within an organization all in agreement that data collection and management is, is something that whilst they may have made steps, there's still plenty of room for improvement. Why is this? Um, why, why are people placing such an emphasis on, da on data and, and why am I uh, on this webinar today really talking about it? Well, the first principle really is that data should be the foundation of all successful strategies and, and really sustainability is no exception. I mean, if you look across the rest of your organization into all of the different departments and really figure out how they go about improving performance, putting in place targets, um, developing a strategy. It's very rare that you would come across uh, individuals or groups of individuals doing this without data. Um, and that's why sustainability is no exception. But we understand that firms aren't going to go from sort of almost zero to hero in terms of sustainability overnight. There's definitely a progression. And the amount of data you need and the number the sort of analytic capabilities, that will also change as the maturity of your firm strategy changes. But at the very bottom there, we see collect. It's, it's one of the most important stages is to collect and centralize sustainability data. A number of firms or individuals may believe they, they understand what um, the big risks are to their organization or, or their performance in terms of energy management. But when we actually work with firms to dial down into what is the problem, what are the risks. It actually appears that there's some that they've never acknowledged before because they've never actually looked into the broad issue of sustainability across their entire organization. So the first step should always be to collect and centralize sustainability data. 
that allows you to create the baseline of exactly where you are today and where you want to go um, tomorrow. The monitoring phase comes next. So the ability to actually take all of that data and start to understand it, start running some reports on it and communicate some of the aspects in terms of, okay, well, this is where we are today. We're, we're doing okay here, but we've flagged these areas as sort of big areas for improvement. And then you move into the manage phase. So that's where you're, you're going beyond just monitoring. You're actually putting in place a number of targets, initiatives, strategies, because you've set out goals to improve your performance. And you need to manage the, the portfolio of targets you have in place. You need to manage your projects to ensure you're still on track to hit those all important targets. And then the final phase that we get to really is optimize. And this is the phase when sustainability really isn't playing catch up anymore. Uh, sustainability has been implemented within existing business processes and operations. And now going forward, each new um, sort of operation or process will have a sustainability aspect attached to it. And you're looking at, for that continuous improvement of your sustainability performance and strategy. And that really sort of leads into this sort of next slide of, of how important data is for continuous improvement. So again, we, we just lay out here the sort of four main phases that firms should go through in terms of sitting down and understand this is, this is who we are, this is where we are in terms of sustainability, this is where we want to get to. Um, then figuring out what data do we need to, to get to fully understand um, all of that. What level of analysis and interpretation do we need to put on top to understand what's happened? How does that feed back into our strategy and planning? To go to the next level, what new pieces of data should we be collecting? And it goes around in that cycle. And if you continue to do that cycle, you can be sure of it. You will always be continuing to improve your performance and ensuring that your company is as sustainable as it can be. But managing sustainability data is challenging. Um, it's it's not as easy as just uh, sort of invest a bit of money in, in a solution and, and it all becomes simple overnight. There's a lot of things that have to go on um, and continued sort of tweaks. And the, the main reason it's so challenging is because of the three Bs of big data. So volume, velocity, and variety. Uh, we live in a world where we're getting more and more data, um, so much data that we can't even keep up with it. Um, the velocity of that data is then a problem. It's coming thick and fast, but it also comes when you're least expecting it. Um, and being able to then normalize everything and get everything to a time frame which your company works to is a challenge. But then there's also the variety, um, not knowing what's going to be arriving, what form it's going to take, what information is going to be included, what might have been submitted, what changed from the last time you saw this data set. It causes some real big issues if you are not sort of well attuned to the problems and you have clear processes in place for being able to manage um, the sort of issues that arise with big data in terms of sustainability. And that sort of uh, brings me to the more so the conclusion of, of my section into that the three most common methods of data collection that firms commonly use today are not really fit for purpose at a corporate level. Um, so those three for forms are manual data entry, um, OCR, or EDI. Each one um, was a sort of progression of the other. Um, however, we do still find a lot of firms reliant upon the earliest uh, one, which was a good old reliable manual data entry, which is anything but reliable um, because it's time intensive, it's error prone, you can find gaps, you really only capture data at low granularity because for each piece of data you're capturing, it's time of someone keying it in. OCR, um, again, there's a lag in terms of when you get that information. The information you're always capturing is old, but it's also issues involved with what happens when it changes? What happens if my utility provider changes the tariff structure? Can my OCR processes deal with that? And then for EDI, again, it's it's a movement towards more digital um, sharing of information, but it can't quite handle that variety aspect. All you're doing is, is shifting the problem to, I'm collecting a lot of data digitally, but it's all completely unstructured. 
how do I even approach this and how do I check it's, it's all correct. So that's what we really see today is that data is the foundation and all firms should start by putting in place a good data management strategy that really should look to go beyond these three methods for capturing their core sustainability data. So that's, that's all from me um, for the moment and I look forward to taking your questions towards the end of the session. Yeah, thank you, Alistair. That was great. I think Alistair did a great job highlighting three key points related to sustainability reporting. First of all, the underlying data is foundational to both reporting and decision making regarding sustainability. But as Alistair shared, there are significant challenges associated with collecting this data. And finally, the most common methods of data collection depend largely on manual processes that are inherently flawed. So thanks again, Alistair. And now let's talk about how the automation of energy and water data collection can bring real benefits to those trying to do sustainability reporting and other types of analysis with energy and water data. A good place to start is with an appreciation for how much technology is changing the world. As an example, it wasn't too long ago when accessing information meant going to the library, using a card catalog to find books that might be helpful, and then reading through them to find useful information. Now, thanks to Google, the world's information is just a click away. It's hard to imagine life without computer-aided search. Technology has impacted virtually every industry in amazing ways. Think about the impact that technology has had on the way automobiles are manufactured. Now, robots and computer control systems have automated the assembly of new vehicles, resulting in lower costs, higher quality, and faster delivery. Yet with all the changes technology has brought to industry around the world, there are still a few places that are underserved by these innovations. The utility industry is one of those places. We work in a world where the primary way that utility data is aggregated still includes the printing and mailing of bills, scanning an OCR, and rooms full of people manually entering data into computer systems. The result of all this is that energy data is expensive, error prone, and often incomplete, leading to reporting mistakes and poor decision making. But why is capturing energy data so difficult? Well, utility data is complicated. There are thousands of utilities, literally billions of meters, and nearly 100,000 different tariffs around the world. And there are no standards around how this data is shared. You can see it's a huge challenge. But now, industry changes and advances in technology make it possible to bring automation to the utility market for the first time. So let's talk about some of these changes. First of all, the widespread adoption of utility portals, which provide utility customers with access to billing and meter data, has provided a means for customers to access this information in a machine-readable format. Secondly, the advent of cloud-based computing has given technology companies access to massive computing resources, both regularly scheduled and ad hoc computer tasks at extremely low cost. Thirdly, new database technologies and the use of federated data models has allowed for huge amounts of data in different formats and with different semantic relationships to be normalized without losing the fidelity of the source data. This problem is particularly pronounced with utility data, and solving this problem was critical to bringing automation to the collection and delivery of utility data. And finally, the maturity of web-based automation tools has allowed for the scalable processing of millions of data points accessed from thousands of different sources across the internet. It's the confluence of these technological advancements and industry changes that has allowed for the automation of utility data for the first time. So what are the benefits of automated energy data? Well, automation inherently brings with it benefits associated with both scale and cost savings. Instead of adding personnel resources in a linear fashion as volume grows, with automation, customers can add volume without adding people and will actually see their costs decline as their volume grows. And the resulting data is delivered faster with fewer errors and with much more detail. So why is automation so critical for sustainability reporting? Well, it's for a variety of reasons. First of all, it brings real operational efficiencies and cost savings to the process of aggregating the data required for reporting. And secondly, only through automation can organizations consistently get accurate and detailed information delivered in a timely fashion to support the rigorous requirements around sustainability reporting. And finally, when combined with software visualization tools like those that Credit360 will talk about, automated energy and water data provide the transparency 
and visibility organizations require to support decision making. So in summary, we've talked about how up until recently, collecting utility data was complex and an impediment to energy management and sustainability reporting. But now with industry changes and technological advances, automating the collection and normalization of energy and water data is bringing efficiency to organizations that already report on sustainability and allowing organizations that don't yet report on sustainability to do so for the first time. And now I'd like to hand it over to Alistair Blackmore with Credit360 to talk about how software can be used for data visualization, sustainability reporting, and performance management. Excellent, thank you very much. So as Eric said, I will describe and talk through a few case studies and some examples of how we can take this excellent quality utility data, which has had many layers of, um, of analysis and approval already performed on it, and use that in a sustainability reporting and performance management platform. And what are the benefits of doing that exercise? Um, my name is Alistair Blackmore. I'm the head of implementation at Credit360, and I've got um, more than 10 years' experience with sustainability reporting and management, working with a range of um, Credit360 clients. Um, and for those of you who don't know anything about Credit360, we are sustainability and EHS software specialists. We have over a decade of experience. The product's been in place for 13 years. We develop it ourselves, and we tend to host it. And that's one of the advantages um, of, as Eric has talked about, the evolution of web-based software applications. Because they're all in the cloud, communication between these applications is becoming increasingly easy. Uh, we can also offer installed options, and um, we have existing integrations with numerous automated data sources, including Urgenet and Energy Star and others. Uh, here are several of our key partnerships and accreditations. We've got over 200 clients with 400,000 users uh, in, across the globe. And we conceive of our product in five key areas, supply chain, energy and carbon, corporate social responsibility, EHS, and compliance. And each of these different solution areas can benefit from automated data coming from third party sources, whether that's a, a utility meter provider or um, I'll touch on uh, another potential, which is automated data from other suppliers that isn't necessarily utility based. So, integrating automated data what is it? What's that about? And what does that mean for the sustainability reporting professional? Well, essentially, the, the theory is that if the data is already in the cloud, we can communicate that from one source to another source, and you can then use that in different ways without any of the loss of integrity, um, as Eric has described. This is becoming increasingly easy due to the experience that we all have within the sector and also expectations. There is an expectation that this will be available, and you, as uh, potential um, users of the data, um, understandably are aware of technological improvement. Therefore, we have all as suppliers try to adapt and keep up to date with that. As Eric described, the, the, the utility world is um, best described as federated. It's, it's completely different in different countries and across different utility types. And there's no agreed standardization. Um, you, know, you could receive a paper invoice from one of your suppliers, and you could have a fully integrated web solution from another supplier where you can check your data and even download it to Excel. There really is a very wide spectrum and the chances of you having a corporate strategy that's chosen one utility provider um, is, is very slim because simply there, there isn't that level of competition in the utility market to enable that because it's inherently geographic. The utility will provide energy data for a specific market. As a result of that, we've had to work with a range of different protocols and, and, and all sustainability data software will have to do the same. And that can include push, where the utility provider is hosting data to us. That could be via HTTPS, they could be emailing us, or there are some even more specific protocols. For example, in the Nordic countries, they have something called EDIEL, which is, is very specific to transferring utility data um, within the Nordic countries of Sweden, Denmark, and Norway. Equally, we can pull data, so we can listen to FTP sites for when files have been dropped there, or if the utility provider 
or in the case of Urgenet, provide an API where we can pull that data directly on demand from the Credit360 application or other software applications, um, then that enables us to pull that data at our, um, at our request. An example of where this has been quite useful um, is a Scandinavian clothing retailer, H&M. They are um, present in 42 countries globally. So um, the federated nature of the utility market is a particular problem for them. Historically, the way that they were collecting data was manually. The, the energy provider within each country was responsible for completing data on an annual basis for every single store within their portfolio. Now, if you imagine, this is a company with a portfolio that has now grown to over 3,500 stores, plus the distribution centers, plus the warehouses, plus the manufacturing sites, and the offices that back that up. Collecting data across a portfolio so large is a very time-consuming process. But by automating that, and by having that data directly posted, we've been able to, on a country-by-country -country basis, remove that step where the country manager is having to enter that data. The data is automatically posted. The country manager have, has visibility of that data within the system so that they can start to analyze the data. And rather simply than taking their utility bills or Excel spreadsheets from the utility provider and providing that centrally, we're now able to have a dialogue. We're now able to see, well, why was this store good? Let's go and investigate. So once that data is in the system, as I've mentioned, we can look at it in a couple of different ways. And you can really split these into two broad categories. You can look at it on an individual store or, in the case of H&M, or a meter example. So you're looking at very high granularity data. We're talking 15-minute intervals here. This enables you to actively monitor what's happening within each individual location. You can apply exception reporting, for example, show me all locations that consumed more than 10% of their daily energy consumption at the weekend. If you're running an office location and you're not expecting employees to be present on Saturday and Sunday, then why all of a sudden was their data, was their sorry, energy consumed on a Saturday and a Sunday? We can then also set alarms. So if consumption goes over a particular percentage, then let's email the people who are responsible for that electricity consumption and let's start making people change the behavior by making them responsible and alerting them in advance, rather than what was happening maybe as, as recently as five or six years ago, where people weren't that responsive and it was all very retrospective. So you'd say, your energy consumption went up this year. And you'd look back and you'd go, oh yes, so it did. Well, it's a bit too late to do anything about it. So by increasing um, and, and catching anything, any exceptions at points when they're actually occurring, we're able to really and eliminate and drive improvement. And then the other side that we can look at is, is aggregating data, both through time and through the business structure. We can have automatically updating dashboards so that people who are more at the C level and are wanting to see an overview, whilst they want to be assured that the granular data is being taken care of, they probably don't realistically have the time to be assessing it at that level of detail. And they want to see a very quick and intuitive way of looking at hotspots. Are we improving? Are we getting worse? If we are, where are the particular areas? What are the focus points? And what are we going to do to make a difference? Here's an example of a couple of visualizations that I think are particularly valuable and particularly important within, um, within the context that we're discussing. So the first one on the left-hand side is, it's not utility data, so forgive me for that. It's actually waste data, but it is provided in an automated data feed from a third party for this particular client. They have now aggregated that data from their third party contractor, and they are identifying locations which have high recycling and low landfill and the opposite. Now, with the waste sector, it's probably likely to be um, quite beyond or, or somewhat beyond the control of the reporting organization because they're probably defined by the organizations collecting waste on their behalf. Um, and whilst everyone would love to have maximum amount of recycling, potentially there just isn't the possibility for that service where these facilities are located that have high waste to landfill. But at least it asks the question and it, it makes us think, what's happening in Wales? Why has Wales got the worst 
ratio of landfill, waste to landfill versus waste to recycled. Now that might be, as I mentioned, because um, the facilities just aren't available, but equally it might be a process improvement. It might be an education thing. And by analysing the data like this automatically and not spending your whole year collecting the data, it means you can start to go and investigate what's happening in Wales, can we make improvements, can we train some individuals to, to behave in a way that will mean we aren't, um, we aren't facing the same situation next year. Let's bring everyone down and either into that green box or closer towards the recycling axis. If we go back to the example that I mentioned of H&M, here's a store carbon intensity chart for one year. Now this shows carbon per meter squared. And this is another thing that I want to touch on, which is the value of having utility data sitting centrally within your sustainability system. Because at this point, we've got the confluence of two data sets. We've got the utility data providing automated data for you. And we also have the property portfolio database giving us the floor area data. And by taking one and dividing it by the other, we can see which countries consume electricity. Subtly different, actually, at this point, it's which countries consume carbon more than others. Now, in this case, you'll see that um, countries like Finland, Norway, and Switzerland, and Sweden are very low. And the reason for that is the electricity mix within their grid is uh, mostly comprised of hydroelectric and nuclear. And at the opposite end of the spectrum, you have Singapore, Greece, Poland, who have a high proportion of coal within their, their grid. Now, identifying that and understanding where your corporate carbon footprint lies has taken many different data sets, a lot of different calculation, and yet we're able to see it dynamically update on a dashboard in a very engaging and visual manner. I just touched on emissions calculations by putting the um, electricity and other utility data into the system. Centrally, you can use um, standard emissions calculations tools. This will enable consistent carbon reporting year on year. You have it audited and the process audited once and continually the auditors will have to do uh, decreasing amounts of work in order to provide the same level of assurance across that data. We've got pre-approved data sources as do all sustainability um, data reporting platforms for the carbon emissions so you're not scrambling around trying to work out which emission factor is the best to use and also trying to make sure that you apply it in the correct way, that's all set up for you. And the whole purpose and the whole value add of these propositions is because it's fully automated, it will save you time, which means you can increase the frequency. It's something I touched on at the beginning of, of my section, that historically we were looking back and we were saying what happened last year, but now we're saying, okay, what's happened up to this quarter or maybe what happened this month and what changes can I make against my target so that I can hopefully try and achieve that target before the end of the year. It really means that we're moving away from not just measuring our data, actively managing it. Here's another great example of a chart that I think helps people to make decisions. Again, it's got those two data sources where we've got um, carbon, and so it's the total tons of CO2 by physical location, that's marked in red, and then we have the intensity and the intensity is in um, kilowatt hours per meter squared. So it would be interesting to go to the beginning of this chart and try and understand why these locations have such a high intensity. Is it acceptable? Are they doing something? Um, if it's a retail outlet, have they got their stores open? If it's a manufacturing location, potentially it's because it's working, it's working through the night, in which case then it's totally acceptable. But if it's not, are we doing something wrong? Have we got the building management system configured correctly? Some of these things could really be quick wins, and by analysing this data, you can identify where those quick wins lie. And here's another example of something that's relatively similar, yet it covers a much wider database, data set, and it's aggregated in a different way. Rather than presenting the data as a chart or a graph, we have predefined targets. And depending upon your performance or your operating company in this case, the operating company's performance against those targets, they will either be on target, partially achieve their target, or they'll be non-compliant with the target. This is actually a much wider data set. The top section has utility data from water, 
The second section has um, utility data from energy consumption, and then the remainder of the section covers a very diverse set of data, including um, supplier data. Does the supplier um, match the code of compliance? Um, and then also data relating to employees and health and safety. So we have a real sustainability scorecard here. And quite quickly and quite visually, we can see how are we doing? And not only how are we doing this quarter, but have we improved since last quarter? Finally, I just wanted to go through a particular case study. Um, we were lucky enough to work with the London 2012 Olympics when they were building the, uh, the venues, the Olympic Park venues. And we did a case study about the, the potential cost saving of the, of the work that we did with them. And obviously, there was cost associated with doing the work, but the cost saving that we, we managed to deliver. Um, I'll just go through the case study in a little bit of, uh, of detail just to let you know about it. Um, within the Olympic Park, there were 31 separate projects. A project might have been the aquatic center or the main stadium. Um, and they collected data from each of the 31 projects every single month. And that includes energy data, water data, waste, material, biodiversity. And essentially, that meant there were 217 data submissions per month, 31 projects, seven beams. And a performance scorecard needed to be created against all of these, and it was part of the contractual obligation for delivering the London 2012 Olympics. The delivery authority had to report this back to the UK government. The Credit 360 system, we handled all of that. And so the data provider, the supplier, would enter the data. Uh, utility data would be populated where it was available. And that, in essence, saved um, an individual from collating that data from spreadsheets, which is how it would have been done otherwise. We estimated that that saved about um, 400 hours just collating that data on a monthly basis. We were then calculating the carbon footprint on that data and analyzing that data. And that added another about 90 hours on top of it. And then also, finally, generating massive Excel documents that were then fed into something called program controls, which totaled about 20 hours a month. And this was all fully automated, and which enabled us to save about 540 hours per month, which, depending on how efficient an individual is or, and also what salary level they are, we roughly equated to about $600,000 and a year savings from implementing a sustainability solution with integrated utility data. As you can imagine, that's significantly more than the cost of implementing. So building a business case to do this, um, not only does it give you far greater control over the data, but um, you can also build a business case to say it will save us money. And that's all from me, thank you. All right, thank you, Alistair. So that's a great job. Let's just summarize a few key takeaways from Alistair's presentation. First of all, he talked about how important it is to store data in a central repository uh, to lead to powerful new insights. He also talked about the, the, uh, the power of automated data collection and how it allows organizations to move from simply reporting on sustainability to actually managing results. And finally, he talked about how these efforts uh, not only allow organizations to report on sustainability, but also lead to real cost savings. So thanks again, Alistair. Now we'd like to take a few minutes for Q&A. Actually, you guys have been great. We've got a bunch of questions that have rolled in. So um, I want to encourage you to go ahead and keep submitting questions because even if we're not able to get to them during the uh, webinar, we'll go ahead and follow up and, and answer them via email. But we do have a bunch of questions that um, we've captured already. And um, I think this first one I'd like to pose um, is probably best answered by Verdantic. So, Alistair, here's a question for you. If we don't have a data management strategy in place, what should be the first step that we take? Uh, yeah, so I, I guess probably a, a quite a good question based on the sort of emphasis that I was talking around, sort of the importance of data management. That it is important at the same time not to get hung up on data, 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 and, and, and get too distracted by that because ultimately this isn't a data problem. The problem here is sustainability. That's what you're trying to solve. Data is the tool which you're going to use to solve that problem. So if you do not have a data management and strategy, what, what I really encourage you to do first of all is go away, 
take a good, hard sort of work at your own organization, look at your peers, try and figure out what is sort of material to your industry, your firm, um, seek conversations maybe with some external um, individuals to also help you out there, and, and really weigh down what, what it is you're hoping to achieve. Like, what, what do we actually want to be able to do? And then once you've done those steps, it should hopefully be quite easy for you to start thinking about, okay, well, to do this, I'll need to have this piece of information, I want to monitor this KPI, and then that should help you form which data you should be um, collecting. And then once you've got that, you can start the investigative process of, okay, where, where would I find that information within my organization? So I think Alistair Credit360 gave um, a good example of even square footage uh, data. It's a very valuable metric you can use for doing a lot of standardization, but you don't want to go through the process of keying all that information. It likely sits somewhere within the organization already. So that's the next stage then of, of mapping out where these data sources may be. And then the final stage is engaging with someone, um, be those internal teams or technology services firms or a software supplier to help get their help on, okay, how do we take information from one source and bring it all into the one central system so that we can really sort of kick on and, and start doing the analysis and, and reporting that we want to do. Okay, great. Thank you, Alistair. And then this question I think is well suited for Credit360. Uh, and the question is, new GHG protocol scope two guidelines have been released for market-based emission factor selection. How can a system help meet the requirements for this standard? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I think if, if anyone is, is aware of carbon footprinting and the greenhouse gas protocol, define essentially what's the agreed way of working out your carbon footprint. And uh, utility data is conceived of as being scope two because you don't burn the fossil fuel itself, but by clicking a switch, you demand that downstream or upstream rather someone else is burning on your behalf. Now, they've just changed the legislation or the guidance in January. Um, and the new guidance is you can use, you can report your carbon in one of two ways. You can either report it as net emissions, which means you can accept the tariff if it's uh, from your supplier, if it's a green tariff. So if you were to buy electricity from a, a solar generator or a wind generator, you could report that as zero rated. But the remainder of the electricity that you purchase, you would use uh, what's called a residual emission factor. Now, by having all that data in one central repository, and using uh, an agreed emission factor calculation tool, you don't have to recalculate it one or two or three or four or five times, however you want to cut the data. You can rely on your sustainability system to do that for you. That's the whole purpose of it. Yes, it might take you time to set it up once in advance, but that means then you can do that on a monthly basis and you can compare your net versus your gross emissions without having to be lengthy and time consuming. Okay, great, thank you. And then there's a couple questions that were submitted for Urgenet that I'm gonna to try to combine with one answer. The first question was, how does Urgenet get its data? And the other question was, where does Urgenet, Urgenet have utility coverage? So um, let me answer those by first um, uh, saying, uh, when we talk about data, what type of data does Urgenet provide? We really provide two different types of data. One is utility data, which is essentially all the information that you would find on a utility bill. I mean, literally everything on there, all the detail on the bill, along with a copy of the bill image itself. And then also meter data. So where utilities have deployed smart meters and provide access to that information, um, Urgenet is also collecting that. So when we talk about Urgenet data, then we're talking both about utility bill data and meter data. And the way we get access to it in, in response to this question is we've built a technology platform um, with connectors to utility billing systems and, and smart meter systems. Um, in North America, we've done probably north of 1,500 integrations to utilities that represent north of 80% of all utility accounts in North America. And as it relates to the question around coverage, that is rolling out rapidly on a global basis. So I think we're live now in over 20 countries in Europe, and we're also processing data in both Latin America and now Asia Pacific for the first time. Um, so hopefully that answers uh, some questions that were directed there at Urgenet. 
There's another one here that I think is well suited, um, Alistair, for you and Verdantix. And that is, if the only benefit of better data management is that all the data is stored in one place, isn't it really just a like a giant Excel spreadsheet? Uh, yeah, good, uh, good question. And I mean, realistically, it is. Um, if you're taking all the data and you're storing it in one place, what you have done is you've created a giant Excel spreadsheet. But what I think people need to appreciate and understand is giant probably doesn't do it justice. It would be a complete monster. Um, and uh, one thing about monsters is they're not very nice. And they would be, a, it's a real pain to, to sort of update that. And I think that's all um, what the sort of the urgent value proposition around is the fact that the pain and effort of, of centralizing data is one aspect. But it only takes one data source to change. So it only takes, say, an update in a utility to bring out this new new type of tariff that suddenly 5,000 of your sites are, are on. OK, uh, how, how do I go about updating my monster Excel spreadsheet? Or there's a change in guidance from the greenhouse gas protocol about what carbon factors should actually be used and how you should go about calculating it. OK, where do I find that component in my Excel spreadsheet? OK, also, the, the automation of the processes, so getting data in there, is very difficult. Um, so whilst, in principle, when you're talking about centralized data, you are realistically talking about a very big Excel spreadsheet. But anyone who has experience of managing big Excel spreadsheets know that it's not a sustainable way to do it. And it, it really prevents any form of, of scalability. And what the solutions we're seeing in the market are providing is not only that centralized, that centralization bit of data, of the data puzzle, but also allows you to do much more with it. Um, it means that when you're taking all the information into this repository, it's all getting checked. It's all valid. It's good quality data. So you know that you're building your decisions and, and sort of investments on accurate data. But then it also allows you to put in place the, the processes that mean you can automate a lot of the analysis that you would plan to do on that data. It's not a sort of static database. It's very much dynamic of where you can go in and, and chop and change and slice and dice the information in any way you wish with relative ease. And it's also engaging for lots of um, individuals to use. It's not as overwhelming and sort of hard to get into as what would be the case if it was just one sort of really, really big Excel spreadsheet. OK, great. Thanks. And and uh, yeah, monsters are mean. So we're, we're happy to avoid them where we can, Alistair. Thanks. Thanks for that response. And then this one, I think, is well suited. Uh, Alistair with Credit360 for you uh, again. And the question is, what recommendations do you have for facilities where data capture is either very difficult or not currently possible? Yeah, OK. Uh, that is something that we come across. And I think it, strangely, it's something that I hope happens less frequently over time as coverage. You know, Eric, you've just been through how your coverage is increasing so dramatically, and that's you know, fantastic. Um, and hopefully, this is not a problem that we'll be seeing in 20 years' time. But as it stands, there are locations where data is uh, is not available, and the there are various ways that we can estimate for that. Um, and one of the best methodologies is to pick uh, a functional value of a similar location. So, for example, um, a, a retail branch might be its floor area or the number of units that it sells within a time period. And to pick a similar location and say, well, with 100 of the units, they consume this much energy. So, therefore, we'll apply the same. And this store is 200, so we assume it's going to consume twice the energy. And then you aggregate that up. Now, it's important to keep those two separate because you need to know what's actual data and what's estimated data. And you certainly get to a point at which, if you've got more than a percentage, more than, say, 20 or 30% of your data is estimated, I mean, realistically, how reliable is your data set at that point? Um, but these are real world situations that people face. Um, and so by using an estimation methodology that's documented and can be signed off by the auditors, then that is a way to, to patch that hole. Okay, great. Thank you. 
and here's a question that just came in for Urgenet. I probably should have addressed this when I was answering the question earlier, but uh, the question is, can Urgenet access historical data? And if so, how, how far back? And yeah, when we are accessing both meter data and utility data and delivering that to our customers, we also do have access to historical data when the utility um, provides it, makes it available, which is in most cases. Um, often six months might be an average when it comes to billing data, usually more when it comes to meter data. Sometimes we see as much as a year or three years worth of historical data. And of course, that's important to our customers. Usually when they add new accounts uh, or request that we add new accounts to the data that we're delivering for them, they'll also want us to provide the historical data so they can start off with some sort of baseline for benchmarking. So that was a good question. I should have mentioned that earlier. Um, and then here's a, a one that just came in, uh, I think also uh, for Credit360, this would be a good one. I'm interested in your answer to this. Uh, and that is, can Credit360 aggregate emissions data for vehicle fleets? Uh, interesting question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Credit360, well, and I think I suspect the majority of our competitors, um, when you get them out of the box, they, they're agnostic as to the data we're capturing. Uh, we could capture cups of coffee consumed if we wanted. It's just a data point, and you configure the data point to collect whatever data you want. Uh, some good examples of where we have um, vehicle capture would be um, an example um, is, is Philips. They have, obviously, a, a huge number of shipments globally, and um, their, their logistics providers send us data saying we have shipped n tons from location A to location B. We go out to something like MapQuest or Google, find the distance between A and B, and what we then return in the database is uh, a ton kilometer. So how many kilometers was that ton moved? And with that data, you're then able to multiply it with an agreed emission factor for a ton kilometer by that route. For example, C has a very low emission per ton kilometer, whereas air travel is about 17 times worse than uh, than C, tra C travel just by virtue of the how energy intensive it is to put a plane in the sky. So, uh, yes, is the answer. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks for that. I think we perhaps have time for two more questions. Um, this one is best answered, I believe, by Verdantix. So, Alistair, do you find that firms are associating operational excellence with sustainability these days? Uh, yes, we, we do. Um, and one of the, the primary reasons for that is the fact that sort of firms are coming around to the idea that sustainability is, is more than just a sort of green initiative or a, a nice marketing communication, but it's actually a core principle of ensuring that your organization is running in the best way that it can be. It's not having negative impacts. Um, because, for example, if you have uh, a poor sustainability strategy and negative impacts, it will, it will soon catch the attention of consumers or governments, and you will soon find it difficult. Uh, you may end up even losing your social license uh, to operate. So these are all sustainability issues, which, when put in the frame of operational excellence, really sustainability adds another factor of what you should be looking for when deeming um, we are sort of operating the best we can be. So yes, we're definitely seeing um, firms starting to incorporate sustainability uh, sort of initiatives within their operational excellence program because it really does help sort of broaden the horizon and focus away from just sort of the core internal pieces which people, organizations have probably been looking at for sort of 15 to 20 years and it gives them an opportunity to step back readdress the, today's environment but also tomorrow's environment what that means for their business and what they should be doing to uh, sort of move forward to ensure that they're just as successful in 20 years time as, as they are today okay great thanks and i think we'll try to take one more question here and let's see i'll take a shot at at, at answering this um, but the question is what kind of analysis can i do with automated utility data and um, I'll take a crack at this, but our partners really um, have a lot to say about all this. As it relates to UrgeNet, we capture, as I mentioned earlier, all the data points on the bill. And so those data points are used for all sorts of different things, both uh, the type of sustainability reporting that Credit360 talked about, um, but procurement folks care a lot about the data that's on these bills. Um, 
and of course energy managers do as well. There's a lot of detail on the bills and, and these different data points can be used to gain different types of insights into what's happening with your energy spend and be applied in a bunch of different ways. Um, Alistair with Credit360, I'm not sure, maybe you can add something to this question as well in terms of um, the type of analysis that can be done with the data on the bill. Yeah, I'll actually, I'll tie it into the earlier question about scope two reporting. Uh, it doesn't happen in all cases, and in fact, it's probably the minority, but I would expect within the next decade, the majority of bills will have a CO2 uh, figure on them as well. So having a, a provider like Urgenet, who can not only provide you with the cost, but also the consumption and um, the CO2 emissions related to it directly from the electricity and the utility provider, um, will be very important in meeting the greenhouse gas protocol requirements. So that sort of carbon analysis is something which will be, um, I think, it's another data point that you don't want to be manually adding. Um, so that's another sort of analysis to add on to what, what we've already discussed. Okay, great. Thank you for helping there. Well, that's all the time we have for our session today. So yeah, I'd like to thank our panelists, of course, Alistair McDougall with Verdantix and Alistair Blackmore with Credit360. Great work today, guys. But of course, I'd also like to thank all of you who've joined us on the presentation today. I hope you found the session informative and helpful. And as I mentioned earlier, shortly following the conclusion of the webinar today, we'll send you an email with a link to the recording of the event. And that way you can go ahead and, and review any material that you found especially interesting. And it'll also give you something that you can use to share with colleagues in your organization. So thanks again, and we look forward to talking to you again soon.